Afternoon. How you all, how you all doing today? Having a good day? Yeah. yeah, that's what we like to hear. Awesome. So, my name is Andrew Nelson. Many of you guys already know me. I've been here for a couple of days, once or twice, maybe ten times. I don't know. Um, but uh, been involved with Zabbix for for many many years. I actually reached out to a former employer of mine and said, "When did, when did we start using it?" And it was uh, about 2005. So it was uh, quite a while. Things have changed a lot over the years. Written a few programs, um, you know, wrote a few modules, you know, here and there. When long before we had modules, and, uh, and then started working with Red Hat, kind of got away from from uh, Zabbix a little bit. And now, with my current employer, uh, basically own a, a Zabbix server, own a lot of monitoring. So you just hopefully see some more from me soon. So, anyways, let's get right into it. So, normally when we get sit there and we build a Zabbix environment for monitoring, we have a whole process that we have to follow. First, we're going to start with building our servers. Then we're going to install our Zabbix, our database, our web front end, and you know, all the various packages needed. Those you know, usually these are pretty manual. Then we configure our database. We'll configure the uh, Zabbix server, configure the web server. All of these steps can take time. You know, error prone and so forth. Um, and if we have to change an environment, well, we have to go back in and, and fix a few things. And then, of course, we're going to configure the Zabbix agent on our Zabbix server. We're still doing a lot of work. We'll probably end up looking like this guy when we're done, as we then configure the next Zabbix agent on host N. Very, very manual process, like say. So with Ansible, once again, we have to have servers to build it on. So we're going to sit there and we're going to write an Ansible inventory. Now, one thing you, you'll probably notice me talk about, Ansible inventory is the source where you want everything to run. You can write Ansible so that uh, you don't rely on your inventory, but the ideal when you write Ansible code is that it should operate like a function, wherein the variables that get passed in are variables that you find in your inventory. And then the function, the Ansible playbook, will essentially spit out the results according to what you have. So we write our Ansible inventory, what describe the environment, then we write a playbook, you know, using the Ansible collections, which are actually pretty awesome. Um, I did a lot of the work you know, uh, for this presentation using them, and they actually work really, really well. So I was quite impressed with it. Um, unfortunately, in the middle, Zabbix decided to uh, you know, modify one of the packages you know, that uh, put the, the script creation routines in there in a different location. So it broke it, but I think the, uh, the um, collections are now fixed, maybe a, a one or two week lag. So that's pretty cool. Then we run our playbook, you know, as we all do. You know, our playbook runs, and oh darn, we have a typo. This is going to be one of those more frustrating points of Ansible that you're always going to have. You're always going to have a typo, but once you get your typos fixed, you then run it on hundreds of nodes. And of course, as you're running it on hundreds of nodes, go take a nap, have some break, get some coffee, go outside, you know, do that, see that, you know, thing that's you know producing a lot of light in the sky that we never really see too much in, in the, when we're indoors. So. That's the cool part about Ansible is that we can um, be repeatable in what we do. So what was interesting as I'm doing this presentation, as I'm working on it, um, I actually realized that I had a good use case for exactly what I was talking about. So I'm sitting um, at a, a location that's out in the countryside in, in the United States, and you know, I'm using Starlink to connect back to a um, hypervisor that I have. It's you know, in another place, or SSH. And for whatever reason, some of the VMs just wouldn't connect. I, I just could not make it so that I could SSH in, I could ping it, the MAC address wasn't showing up, you know, bridge control on my hypervisor was showing that some of the connectivity wasn't working. I couldn't figure out at which layer in my network it was happening, and I didn't have the time to figure it out. So what did I do? I basically said, to heck with it, I've already got my Ansible playbooks, let me take them, rewrite my inventory, throw it all up in a cloud provider. In this case, I use Google Cloud. So the biggest you know, learning curve for me was actually having to learn Google Cloud. How the heck do I deploy things in their cloud? So I took the time, figured it out, and then deployed my whole environment using the playbooks that I had written before. So essentially, I didn't have to spend the time building it all. What did I have to spend my time on? Building the hosts. That was the hardest part. So as you've heard me already mention, um, probably a couple of times, inventories. Inventories are really critical when writing good Ansible code. Um, it's kind of the one thing that's the hardest to understand when you first write code, um, because you have to have a good data schema to your inventory. Your data schema has to scale. Unfortunately, it's kind of one of those things that experience is the best teacher here. Um, there's a couple of things you can maybe look at and you know, what other people have done. But the idea is that as much data as you can pack into your inventory, the better. 
You don't want to be trying to pack any of your uh, information into your, you know, your roles that you're going to create uh, and so forth. Unless, you know, it's maybe very specific information. And, you know, back when I was working with Red Hat, we had many, many conversations with customers about, well, where do we put these configuration items? We put them in a role, we put them in our inventory, and kind of the, the bigger one is, how often is this value going to change? If it's a matter of, if I'm deploying on this kind of host and I'm going to always have a file in this particular location, okay, fine, put it in the, in the, uh, in the role. Maybe as a default variable. Um, just in case you have to override it on one machine, you know, uh, at some point, or in five to ten years, you have to come back and like, well, yeah, we're not putting things in the same location. So uh, that's kind of the, the important thing. So what's a static inventory? We have several types of inventories. You know, we can do a static inventory, we can do an inventory script. So a static inventory is essentially an, a YAML file. Um, most often, you can use you know our older INI file format, but I'm a I'm a, someone who prefers to use the uh, YAML file formats, you know, very descriptive, can be very easy to follow and so forth. What I also like to do is break my um, inventories into mul multiple files using essentially a directory structure where I'll have my inventory file at the top level, and then I'll have a vars directory, and I'll have you know, group variables sitting in there, and then I'll have a host directory with host specific variables sitting in there. Um, so here's an example of basically a top level simple static inventory file. I can also use Zabbix as my source of inventory. Now, we'll talk about some of the um, interesting side effects of doing that here later on, but you know, the, the Zabbix uh, API you know, or inventory plugin, very straightforward. Here's the, uh, the YAML script to the configuration file that we use for, for the plugin. We basically tell it what server we're gonna point to, give it a, a user login for the API, um, and then what do we want to pull back? We're going to you know, pull back everything and so forth. So what does it show? Well, this is what it shows for one simple server. So you know, very simple, very straightforward data. We can extend this in a few other ways uh, and so forth. And one of the things that I did when I was in my you know, um, cloud environment when I did, I used the Google Compute uh, inventory item. Now, as you can notice here, I have the standard inventory plugin, you know, going, but then I also did a couple of interesting things here. Um, you know, I, I use the compose function, so I can now place a variable into my inventory um, from the script. Um, I also went ahead and set up um, some tagging for groups to set up, so I could say, like, you know, is this host a Zabbix server? Is this host a Zabbix client? Is this a proxy? And that was all leveraged by the labels that I placed into the VMs inside of the uh, the compute environment. So I set a label to it and then my inventory was written so my playbooks would consume that information. But what I really thought was pretty awesome is I can combine the two. I can take a static inventory file like I had before, I can combine it with a, you know, inventory plugin like Google Compute and use the two. Now what's really awesome about here is I can now individually override things. So as I've got my configuration, um, you know, going for my environment, I may say that, hey, um, my clients, I want to, you know, individually override something on a client. I could have also used metavars inside of the, you know, Google environment, but what if I'm going to go between multiple cloud providers? Well, now it's maybe useful to place this into my inventory file here. So, what do we do for install? This is essentially a simple playbook to install a Zabbix server using the community plugins. Um, this takes care of you know almost every single step needed. Um, I'll have a GitHub link for you guys later, you know, to the full playbooks that I used. Um, but it's it's pretty pretty awesome in what it will do. This will also work on Ubuntu, Fedora, RHEL, uh, and, and so forth. Um, so it's written to be very portable to many different environments. Um, most often, we'll go straight out to the Zabbix repos, configure the repos, pull the packages, install them configure the database as needed, uh, and so forth. So on, because I'm doing this on um, CentOS, in my case, there was one thing I need to do, and that was configure a SE Linux Boolean to allow, uh, for, um, allow for one of the components uh, for access to, I think, execution uh, memory sharing, uh, I think is what it was. But you know, it was very straightforward. Also in this one, I copied my SSL certs over into the host, so I, you know, was fully, you know, uh, TLS compliant on my uh, server. So, 
One of the things we do uh, kind of end up getting into when we start working with uh, inventory scripts and so forth is you know, kind of an imperative or declarative workflow. Now, an imperative workflow is where um, we go out, we pull something. You know, in this case, we're just going to use the Zabbix inventory script just to tell us what hosts we're going to run on. And then, you know, we might place a lot of our logic inside of each role um, in terms of like, you know, if, you, if your roles have something that says delegate to, you know, to a specific host name, it's probably not a good idea. Or if it's saying when ansible.hostname equals, you know, and then this task executes inside the role, those are imperative type operations. So they are things that you don't necessarily know until you operate or until you execute the code. Um, CF Engine was kind of a, a very uh, traditional mechanism that you know, used this kind of a workflow. Um, whereas in an Ansible environment, you ideally want to go into a more declarative style, where just as I described earlier, Ansible works as a function, where my inventory has all the variables that I need, my playbook is my function, and the resulting configuration in the environment is what I want. So when I was talking about where the logic is, so if we have an imperative workflow, I'm going to have a little bit of logic in my inventory script, but I'm going to place a lot more of my logic in my roles and maybe directly into my playbook. Maybe I'm going to put a little bit more variables into my playbook directly. And that's useful. That works uh, pretty well. And this is actually really good for you know, someone getting started off with, Zap, or with Ansible. Excuse me. It works. The only challenge is it doesn't quite scale so well. And you know, part of this conversation is about scale. How do I get this to work across hundreds or thousands of nodes? So part of the design is how do we design the things to scale? Once again, inventory is your source of truth. So if I were to use a more declarative workflow, I now place everything inside of my inventory. Um, and now when I execute my playbook, it configures it. Now, one example of that, when I have my client systems out there. Because remember I talked about having multiple clients. So in my scenario, I had set up a few. Let's say I have my client, you know, by default, it's going to talk to the Zabbix server. But let's say it's in a data center and we just put a uh, Zabbix proxy in there and we now want this client to talk to a proxy. Well, it's actually really simple. We could do a few things. If we were to use an imperative workflow, we could, you know, maybe put some techniques into the uh, the role that says if we're in this data center, then we're going to use this variable and so forth. Or I put it into my declarative inventory as I described earlier. I set these three variables. I re-execute the exact same playbook that I you know, did to install a machine. And boom, it does it. Now, the reason it does it is because in the Ansible collection that is created, it will actually contact the Zabbix server and create the host entry and it will, you know, using the API and then update it. So if I have multiple templates I wish to add to it, that's where I would do it too. Um, so in this case, um, I now deploy it. It's going to go out, reconfigure the agent on the machine. So the agent is now going to be reconfigured to talk to the proxy that I've told it to talk to. It's also going to log into the Zabbix server via the API. And in, in doing so, it's going to update it there to say you are now communicating to Zabbix via this API. So now active items can now work correctly. Um, what if I wanted to do this across hundreds of nodes? That can be pretty straightforward. I could maybe put these into a host group where I can maybe say data center one, and I now place all of these items in there, and any host that's in data center one host group now suddenly talks to your proxy. Um, so that's pretty useful. Or, you know, as I could do you know, other ones, like we talked about some before, I can maybe create a, a MySQL group, attach it into um, Ansible to then tell it to use a, a MySQL template, and then configure the agent for MySQL monitoring and so forth. Um, a few years ago, I gave another presentation very much about the similar topic here. That one was about uh, automated event remediation. So we can use Ansible for that too, wherein we can have you know, Zabbix execute Ansible either on the command line or through a webhook, communicate out to something like Ansible Tower or AWX, uh, and then execute a playbook to cause a remediation. In the presentation I gave a few years ago, the situation was I have a, like a squid proxy server that dies. Zabbix recognizes the squid proxy server dies. It then executes the playbook. If it then you know, fixed it, the problem clears. If it didn't clear within a certain timeline, escalator takes over, notifications begin, and there's also a tagging that was occurred. So you can now look back into tower and go, ah, it was job number XYZ. Let me look at the job. Oh, it had these errors. OK, I know now what to fix. Simplifying your whole workflow and your process. So 
I have the code uh, online um, if you guys ever want to look at some of the playbooks uh, and kind of look at some of the, the aspects of what I had done there um, and so forth. And uh, thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, why Polish? Well, unfortunately, my life is uh, you know, involving some Poles. My wife is Polish, so slowly learning it. Uh, you know, it's actually kind of a, an interesting language, to say the least. So, thank you.